Okay, so welcome to the Guarding for Pollinators webinar. I'm Denise Ellsworth with Ohio State University Extension. And this morning we're going to go through a discussion of pollinators uh, with an eye, primarily my background is in Ohio, so we'll, we'll be talking about Ohio pollinators and hopefully you'll be able to translate that information to wherever you're from. We're going to talk about some of the main pollinators, some of the approaches that we can take to gardening for pollinators, some of the plants that are helpful, and also some gardening techniques that I think are really applicable no matter your zone or the kind of the part of the country that you're from. And then finally, I'll share some resources that will help you find plants. We're not going to have time to get into a lot of specific plants, but there are some great resources that will have regional plant lists for your part of the country. So just a little bit about me. My background is in botany and horticulture. I have a, a undergrad in plant pathology from Ohio State University and a master's in natural resources. I was a county extension educator in the Akron Canton area for about 20 years where I taught primarily commercial and consumer horticulture, had a gardening column in the Akron Beacon Journal for a number of years. And then about three years ago moved over to the Department of Entomology in Worcester, but I have a statewide appointment. So I teach about honeybees and, and native pollinators across the state. So I get to really mix that horticulture background with my love for insects and, um, and pollinators and helping folks to, to translate that into what they can do in their gardens. So who are the pollinators? Well, there are a number of different animals depending on where you live that could be pollinators. In Ohio, our main bird is the hummingbird that we see the ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, we don't have pollinating bats in Ohio. We have uh, all our bats are insectivores, but different parts of the country and certainly the world have uh, pollinating bats. So our primary pollinators here are the insects. And we think of bees, of course, but also moths and butterflies, uh, wasps, true flies, beetles, um, lots of different kinds of insects that serve as pollinators. Often when I'm teaching folks about um, attracting pollinators to the garden, there are a lot of concerns about bees in general, and a lot of people put wasps and bees kind of into that same category. But wasps are carnivores, they're collecting insects for their protein source. Bees are vegetarians, they're visiting flowers. And we'll talk about um, more specifically that really makes bees key pollinators is their diet. So they, uh, bees have to visit flowers for their uh, their carbohydrate source and for their protein source. They are visiting flowers, gathering that pollen, taking it back to feed to the young. And that makes them um, really key pollinators. They're adapted for that collection and transport of pollen. Um, and they have the tongues to, to get into those flowers to, to drink the nectar. So bees have a number of adaptations that um, really make them key in that, um, that role as pollinators. Here, a bee on swamp verbane, or um, it's a verbena hastata, which is a nice native plant for Ohio, a real magnet in my garden for lots of different kinds of, of pollinators, including bees. So bees have uh, hairs that are branched, these plumose hairs that help the pollen grains stay attached to the bee. And then she has all kinds of adaptations, the, the female bees, to comb and push and scoop that pollen into different structures on the bee's body to help them transport that pollen back to feed the young. So the leaf cutter bee, the top left image with those long hairs um, under her abdomen, um, other bees, I'd like this mining bee, have hairy armpits, so they have um, those, those hairs, that pollen is gathered there um, next to their bodies. And of course the bumblebees and honeybees with those pockets or baskets on their hind legs where they're scooping and, and mixing and pushing that pollen. So these adaptations helping the bees get that pollen uh, and the nectar back to feed the young. Bees also have this behavior called flower constancy or flower fidelity and that's the tendency for bees to visit the same species in the same foraging visit. So a bee that tends to be working apples in an orchard uh, will visit those apple flowers and isn't so distracted by the dandelions or the hawthorn flowers or other flowers uh, that may be calling out, she tends to be faithful then to those apple flowers. It's a good strategy for the, the bee because it helps the bee stay on those flowers that are offering reward. And of course it's great for the plant because the plant is more short of having a pollinator take the pollen to a receptive flower instead of wasting that pollen. Uh, 
so that apple pollen doesn't end up on the dandelions or on the hawthorn. Um, it ends up on the receptive pistil, the female portion of an apple flower. So just quickly about bees, our three broad groups of bees. We have social bees like bumblebees and honeybees, ground nesting solitary bees and cavity nesting solitary bees. And we're going to talk about those three groups quickly because their habits, their uh, habitat is important for us to know as we're gardening. So with, we're in, including those nesting opportunities for the bees, the plants that they need to create those nests, for example, um, we're, we're incorporating that in addition to the flowers into our garden. So honeybees are best agricultural pollinator with um, th tens of thousands of workers in one colony and very, very faithful. They have this great tendency, this behavior of flower constancy. So they're excellent pollinators. Um, our other main social bee in Ohio are the bumblebees. We have about a dozen species of bumblebees here in the Buckeye State. They are overwintering now as the fertilized queen and as soon as she emerges, maybe down in the southern parts of the state, she's already out, not here in Worcester. Uh, but the, that queen will come out, she needs to feed and start that colony anew. So if we compare bumblebees to honeybee, honeybees, bumblebees are something like annual plants and honeybees are like perennial plants. So the bumblebee has to start that whole colony over every year. So the important point there are those spring flowering plants, how key that is for those bumblebees as they're setting up the new colony. Here's just an example of what happened in my garden. I had an upturned clay pot that I forgot about one winter and uh, didn't, I guess, do all my, my fall cleanup and uh, went out in the garden in the spring. Here's my dog, Ringo. Ringo's looking at that pot and up in, in and out of the hole in that um, overturned clay pot, there's a queen bumblebee going in and out. And you can see the grass, the blades of grass that she had brought in to that underneath that pot and she was going to start her nest there. So bumblebees will easily nest in and around our gardens. Um, me and Ringo and the kitchen garden and the bumblebees wasn't a good mix so I did try to relocate that bumblebee. But an interesting strategy, you know, try to put out some of those upturned clay pots early in the season. Right now somebody said they still have snow on the ground so those queens aren't out setting up shop yet, setting up that nest. And so maybe a good way to bring in, encourage those bumblebees to nest in the far corners of a garden uh, where they're not going to interact with people or pets. Bumblebees will also nest at the base of bunch forming grasses. So this is a, a real nice example. I mean this is a beautiful addition to the landscape and here if we look underneath the blades of grass that have browned out from last year we see that these bumblebees have nested right there on the surface of the soil. Our solitary bees, um, like this mining bee, they're using these tunnels and these cells underground to provision those individual cells uh, with the bee bread, the pollen and nectar, and lay an egg on that bee bread. The egg hatches into the larva. The larva eats that bee bread and then pupates and eventually emerges from, um, from that tunnel. So if you imagine underground, we have this, this um, really kind of, of a development, this highway underground of tunnels and branches leading off into cells where um, these solitary ground nesting bees are nesting. This image here, this is a, uh, at the Toledo Botanical Garden under the shade of an oak tree. So this is really early in the season before the leaves have emerged. And all these little volcanoes are uh, the, the entrance holes where this, um, these bees have emerged. You see her, the female, right there in the middle of this hole and she's kicking out this, the sand and the silt that's uh, fallen down into that tunnel since last uh, spring. And so she's getting that nest ready, that, that tunnel and that, those cells ready to provision with the bee bread and then lay an egg um, for the next generation. These solitary bees are in, in general very docile. They're very easy to co cohabitate with people. Often uh, people don't even realize that these bees are in the garden. And for example, they're at the botanical garden. They're not a concern for the guests. Um, they're not aggressive. These bees, many of them can't even pierce human skin with their sting. So, um, so a very docile bee and, and a bee that's easy to have 
in the garden and not get too worried about. What I do find people are confused about are, are ground nesting yellow jacket wasps, which are um, sometimes put into this category of ground bees. So these that we're talking about are the solitary ground nesting bees, and to contrast with the yellow jackets, which are very aggressive, which are, um, they have alarm pheromones, they can sting multiple times, so they're uh, a difficult um, uh, wasp to cohabitate with. Then we have our cavity nesting solitary bees, like this leaf cutter bee. So here she is on a, a rose leaf, and she's taken this big disc of a leaf off. She chews uh, with her jaws, she removes that piece of leaf. Some portions are oval, some portions are round, and she actually uh, rolls that up in her legs and she flies from um, the leaf, the nice soft leaf that she's, uh, the plant that she's chewed that off of, and she flies to a twig and pulls that leaf disc down into the twig where she makes a little mattress and lines the nursery walls. Then she gathers pollen and nectar to make the bee bread, brings it back into that twig, lays an egg, and then more leaf disc to kind of seal off that, um, that little structure, that little cell for her offspring. Usually these solitary bees don't live long enough to see their offspring. They're doing all the work at the beginning, getting that, that cell provisioned, and then the moms and dads or, or the moms and dads die before the offspring emerge. In our gardens, those cavity nesting bees will nest in twigs in our brush piles. Um, they'll nest in twigs that we've pruned off, say from your sumac or your elderberry bushes. They'll prune, they'll, they'll um, provision the twig down in those pithy centers, or uh, sometimes in places like bamboo wind chimes, and they'll, they'll nest up actually in the middle of those wind chimes. Here's an example from my garden, and um, these are some of those, those provisioned cells, so these little discs that were put together by this leaf cutting bee, and actually petal pieces as well, so these are um, also incorporating petal pieces from my oak leaf hydrangeas, which I was happy to share, and this mom made these into these nice little discs, bee bread inside, provisioned uh, for that egg, and then that offspring grows inside that disc. These were um, in my water spigot that I hadn't used, my outdoor spigot, I hadn't used it all summer, and I had a vase to put some water in, to cut some cut flowers, put it under the outlet, and um, out come these leaf cutting bee uh, discs. So she had uh, provisioned in that cavity in my, uh, my water spigot. But we can have, in Ohio, we have about four or 500 different species of bees. Um, across the country, about 4,000 different species of bees. Across the globe, about 20,000 species. So there's a great diversity in size and um, nutritional needs and nesting needs of all these bees. So let's talk about some approaches to gardening for pollinators. And one of the easiest approaches is to sprinkle a few plants here and there. This is a purple coneflower. Um, you know, almost every gardener in the, in the Midwest has purple coneflowers. And so by incorporating just a few of those pollinator plants into the landscape in pots on the deck or a few plants in the vegetable garden, a few specifically pollinator attractive plants in the perennial bed, uh, we can really draw in a lot of pollinators. So we don't need to have a dedicated spot necessarily uh, unless you want to. So a dedicated gardening space is certainly another approach. And this is the pollinator garden at Penn State, and a really beautiful, large pollinator garden. Um, really nice, they have nice signage, and um, just a, a, a lovely mix of different perennials um, and, um, and other plants in their pollinator garden. So if you're really um, ready to commit to pollinators, you could create a meadow or a prairie, like this prairie down at Dawes Arboretum in Ohio, really beautiful mix of, of native plants. So you don't have that much space, how about a smaller space? This is a, a little prairie planting that we have here in Worcester on the um, OERDC campus, Seacrest Arboretum. We have a little space that's just kind of a mini prairie and a mix of, of locally native perennials. So a number of different approaches, but in general, gardens and farms play a really important role in 
this goal of creating habitat for pollinators. I like to think of all of our gardens, you know, we have a um, hundred and some folks on the webinar this morning, and if we put uh, pinpoints across the country on a map, um, looking at all of our gardens, we're really creating this patchwork of habitat. So even if you have a very small garden, what you're doing is important. You're allowing, you're creating the nutrition, you're um, you're allowing that nesting habitat for different pollinator species. So we can think about recognizing the habitat and pollinators that we already have in the garden, because certainly you have bees now, you have butterflies, maybe you have different birds or mammals, depending on where you live. Thinking about observing the pollinators that we have, maybe thinking about who we want to draw in additionally. Do we want more hummingbirds? Do we want more butterflies? Um, and looking at the plants that are already working in the garden. Then a, a, an eye to the management practices in the garden, the things that we do, our cultural practices that we might be able to adapt a little bit, to change a little, to favor pollinator habitat or favor, um, you know, leaving the um, perennial stems up a little longer so those cavity nesting bees can nest down in those stems, um, leaving the brush pile. Um, to create that habitat, and we'll talk about some different management practices. And then you can actually create a dedicated space, like this beautiful butterfly garden at Holden Arboretum in Lake County, Ohio. So um, a, a dedicated space that is purposefully planted with lots of natives and um, has that real wonderful richness of diversity in flowers, the span of bloom across the season to uh, to draw in the bees and butterflies. And we'll come back to um, their garden approach a little later. So let's talk about some fundamentals of pollinator habitat. This is at the wilds in southeast Ohio, which is a, a, a area of reclaimed strip mine that's um, creating a lot of great habitat for pollinators. And Karen Goodell, who's with, a, uh, she's a biologist with OSU, she has some research projects down there. If you actually look in the back of this image, you can see those crop circles. And Dr. Goodell has planted those crop circles with different mixes of uh, flowering plants, natives and non-natives. And she has those spaced at different distances from these little forest remnants here on the right. And so she's studying how far and which mixes how far will the bees go and which mixes of flowering plants will attract um, the most of those, of those native bees. So this um, diversity, you know, if we look at, at the habitat down here at the wilds, we see lots of flowers, lots of different kinds of flowers. Uh, we have some nesting habitat. Um, there are some, some water features here. Of course, the pollinators need that, that water source. Um, so on a large scale, this is an example of how to build that pollinator habitat. Of course, we don't all have that large scale, but we do need the flowers. So that's really the key addition um, to the garden, the, having those plants that are not just beautiful, but specifically what pollinators need. From a, um, a human point of view, you know, we like to think that flowers are for us, they're for um, our enjoyment, they're beautiful, they smell good, that's, um, that's all put there for us, but of course, the, the flowers are trying to bring in the pollinators with those colors, with those showy petals, with those rewards. And their um, goal then is to attract the pollinators in, give them a little reward, and then invite them back. So that those pollinators are bringing that specific pollen back to that species of, of plant. So attract, uh, reward, and repeat. What are those rewards? Well, we know about the pollen and nectar, right? Those nutritional rewards that, that insects, that bees, and other pollinators need. Also, floral oils can be rewards. Flowers also provide shelter for uh, a, lot of, a lot of insects. In, here in Ohio, we have uh, skunk cabbage just getting ready to bloom. And that skunk cabbage hood can be a little receptacle, a little warm spot for early season pollinators um, to, to claim some shelter and some warmth in. So all these different um, rewards that flowers offer, as well as a place to meet other like-minded pollinators, right? A gathering place uh, for pollinators to, to join. 
So um, I, I like to use catalpa as an example. I think it's a really fascinating flower. If we look at those, uh, you know, we have this beautiful white flower with these nectar guides or lines um, that guide the pollinator right there into the middle of the flower. We have those yellow markings to, um, to mimic the pollen offering in that flower. A, a strategy that catalpa uses that I think is really amazing. And so many plants use these kinds of strategies that, and we're not even aware of this. During the day, catalpa is visited by lots of bees. And so that pollen, or excuse me, that nectar during the day tends to be a really rich nectar, a highly um, sugar concentrated nectar. Then at night, the nectar is less concentrated and the flower then, that white flower, is attracting night pollinators, moths, right? And moths with those long mouth parts, it's a little harder for them to, to suck up a very concentrated nectar. So the plant actually changes its reward based on which pollinator it's trying to attract at different times of the day. So let's look at flowers uh, from, a, um, from a pollinator's perspective. What are the pollinators, what's drawing them in to the flower? And so of course that flower color is attractive. With bees, we usually think of whites and yellows, as well as oranges, pinks, and blues. Um, other pollinators are drawn to um, other colors. And so we think of hummingbirds and we think of red flowers, kind of deep flowers, with a long corolla where um, that hummingbird beak and then tongue can reach down in there and drink out the nectar. So when bees see red, they don't have the light receptors in, um, to see red, they actually see black. So unless a flower has other attractants, it's not the color red that's bringing bees in. There may be other markings on the flower um, that, that, draw the, that draw the pollinator in, but it's not that color per se. Could be the scent, um, could be the, the nectar guides. So the flower color can change when the reward is gone. And this Virginia bluebell, uh, which will, it'll be such a relief to see any day now, right, um, in, our, in our gardens, in our woodlands. Virginia bluebell is a nice example of the signal, the kind of signal that plants send to pollinators. So when the buds are closed, Virginia bluebell is pink. Uh, when, the bud, when the flowers open, when they're receptive, when they're ready, um, they're uh, a, a, a shade of light pink, or excuse me, light blue. And so the pollinators learn those colors. And they know that pink means don't visit, the reward's not there. Um, one shade of blue means, ah, I have the most reward, pollen and nectar, it's ready. And then when the color changes again, it signals to the pollinator, I'm past really being ideal. So visit a different uh, shade of, of blue. Some of those markings that flowers have that we can't see with our eyes, those uh, ultraviolet light markings. On the left, the black-eyed Susan, um, the, the, the top image shows what a bee would see with those dark UV markings toward the center, kind of like a bullseye, drawing the bee in, pointing in to where that reward lies. The marsh marigold on the right, we see you know this, this um, dark image, and it's really the, the idea behind these UV markings is to train the pollinators to be the most efficient, to attract, reward, and repeat, right? Get them in, get them rewarded, send them off, and bring them back. And so these lines and these markings are all like runway lights and directional arrows pointing to dinner um, so that the pollinator can get the, the food and fuel up and leave and come back. Here on this native iris, a beautiful example of these um, bee guides or nectar guides, these lines. In this case, we can see them that uh, lead the pollinator right into um, to the reward. Flower size can also attract pollinators. Uh, many showy flowers are there really to, to uh, send out this signal to advertise to pollinators. This is where you come for dinner. With our composite flowers, like the sunflower, we know that it's actually a, a combination of hundreds of flowers with those disc flowers in the middle and then those ray flowers along the edge. And those ray flowers are really uh, for show. They're colorful, they're um, advertising to the pollinators, but they're often sterile. They don't offer any reward. So it's a way to draw in the pollinators, then the, the disc flowers in the middle have the reward 
um, in this case for those bumblebees. The showiness of a flower, of course we do a lot of breeding to make flowers showy, but um, from an evolutionary perspective then that showy flower is there again to advertise to the pollinators to bring them in. Flower scent um, is, is also to attract the pollinators. So in this case, this hosta, very fragrant. Some of our hostas are really beautifully scented. And that scent is there to help the pollinators find and, and learn that flower. Different flower shapes will attract different pollinators. And so having a mix of these different shapes in our garden will kind of bring in a diverse uh, mix of pollinators. The daisy type flowers tend to have shallow flowers in the middle. Those disc flowers aren't very deep. And so those are good for, in this case, a flower fly in this image um, can, can reach down in there and drink out the nectar or bees with shorter tongues. These daisy flowers can also be good landing pads for butterflies to land and then feed. So a mix of flower shapes. We should have some daisy flowers, some um, flowers in the mint family, flowers in the pea family, flowers in the rose family, some bell-shaped flowers. So these, all these different flower shapes um, advertising to different kinds of pollinators. So pollinators have different lengths of mouth parts and different types of mouth parts. And the, the bee balm on the left is really a neat example. It's a deep flower, and hummingbirds can reach down and, um, and nectar from that flower. But bees don't have long enough tongues for this particular type of bee balm um, to reach down in. So this um, carpenter bee is actually robbing the flower, actually chewing a hole in the petal and reaching in um, to steal the nectar. So without actually working the flower to trans um, to pick up any pollen and, and, um, and transport it from flower to flower, um, actually robbing um, that nectar out. So different bees have different lengths of tongue, and um, having all those different flower shapes and sizes can help meet the needs of those different bees. So let's spend a minute on the idea of pollinator syndromes, which is this um, idea that there are common characteristics among flowers that are visited by different types of pollinators. So if I said to you what, what attracts a hummingbird, um, you would tend to, you probably would say, well, red flowers, flowers that are deep, flowers that offer nectar. And so there are these common characteristics that hummingbird flowers tend to have. It's not a hard and fast rule, so there can be variation. And, and some scientists don't even like this idea so much of pollinator syndromes, but it's helpful, I think, from a gardening perspective. And you know, if I'm trying to attract a lot of hummingbirds, what kinds of plants do I need to add to the garden? So this uh, chart, which I don't expect you to read here, but just to um, be aware that it's out there, this is from the Pollinator Partnership. And they have a, a series of regional plant guides that will help you choose uh, native plants, regionally native plants, to include in your garden. And they have this um, uh, pollinator syndrome chart in there. So if we look down, if we're looking for plants that attract butterflies. Uh, we see that under color we need bright red and purple flowers that ha have nectar guides, um, a faint but fresh odor, uh, lots of nectar. Um, and pollen isn't important for butterflies, so it doesn't matter if those plants have a lot of pollen. So this brings up a nice example for us, which is the ragweed versus goldenrod, which is a um, confusion that, that happens every fall in Ohio. Uh, people hold hay fever against goldenrod. But if we look at goldenrod, the yellow showy flowers, very fragrant, it's visited by lots of insects, it's adapted to uh, pull in those animal pollinators, those insect pollinators. Versus ragweed, which happens to bloom at the same time, it has um, very green flowers, not showy, no scent, no petals and no attractant because it doesn't need anything but the wind to uh, move its pollen from flower to flower. So it just so happens that they bloom at the same time, flower at the same time, and so when the ragweed is put, sending out all this pollen onto the wind, uh, goldenrod is blooming yellow and showy and people notice it and it gets all the blame. But this really comes back to that idea of, of syndrome. So wind-pollinated plants 
like oak tend to not have showy flowers, not fragrant, um, no, you know, no petals or re very reduced petals, um, and uh, no nectar reward because they don't need to bring the pollinators in. So if we're trying to attract different kinds of pollinators, and my other example was hummingbirds, but in this case butterflies, we're trying to attract them to the garden. We really need to think about including those host plants for the caterpillars so that we have that complete butterfly life cycle. So of course for monarch butterflies, we're thinking about milkweeds, and milkweeds are the host plant for the caterpillars. And then as the milkweed uh, flowers, it's a great nectar source for butterflies and lots of other pollinators as well. So many of our plants do that. They, they give double duty, like milkweed. They are that nectar source. They are also, um, they can be a, a, the host source for the caterpillar, or they invite lots of different kinds of pollinators. So these uh, monardas may invite hummingbirds, they may invite bees, um, other, other pollinators to visit. They're also beautiful in the garden. They're, they're herbs. We like to use them for, for different uses. As well as the viburnum in the background here. So in the spring we have these shrub viburnums that are really uh, visited by lots of pollinators. Then when the seeds come on, they're um, attractive to birds and we have lots of of um, fruit feeding birds, migratory birds and other birds that feed on those shrubs. So if we think about kind of that um, multiple duty, I won't say double duty, but it's even more than more than double duty. It can be triple duty. You know, these are garden worthy plants. They're beautiful in our gardens. They're not needy. They don't need a lot of care. They don't have a lot of problems. They don't need a lot of pesticides. They also invite the pollinators and, um, you know, they're, they're great additions to the garden. So this cutleaf uh, sumac is another good example, a flower that's attractive to pollinators. The leaf may be used by leaf cutting bees. They tend to like those really soft uh, leaves like redbud and katsura and roses and itea to take back to the cavity to line their nest. But these actually, the, the sumac is also a good candidate for the leaf cutting bee to nest in the twig. So of course that bee can't break the twig, but if you prune the twigs off, maybe you bundle them up or um, you just leave a pruning cut there on the branch, those cavity nesting bees can nest down inside of that pith because it's spongy and they can line those, um, those twigs and provision those cells for their young. This doesn't damage the plant and we actually hardly even notice that this is happening. Um, raspberry is another example of a plant like that. Great flowers, nice nectar source, and then when we prune those canes, a good place for small cavity nesting bees like the small carpenter bee, not the big one that can get into your, your wood structure, but the small carpenter bee um, and other cavity nesting pollinators to, uh, to move in. Another example of a double duty plant, this is asparagus. So these little bell-shaped flowers that we hardly notice on our asparagus, um, they are attractive to bees, and they have a really bright orange pollen, and of course they're, they're great in the garden, right? We want them for, um, for the food. So a focus on floral abundance and diversity. Lots of flowers, lots of different colors and shapes, uh, lots of different rewards, and um, that's gonna invite lots of, of, of different pollinators to our garden. So how can we build that diversity in the landscape? Let's talk about landscaping uh, with layers. And in this example, this metro park outside of Dayton, where in the lawn layer, they allow dandelions and clovers to bloom. So a nice nectar and, um, for dandelion, a nice pollen source for pollinators. Then we have the herbaceous level, these great perennials and annuals that they've planted there um, and these nice winding beds. And then we have a shrub layer and then behind a tree layer. So we have a really diverse layered landscape, which is good not just for pollinators, it's also good for um, different birds and the habitat that they need. How about creating corridors? So um, something you might wanna do, you've probably done this before, is you go on Google Earth and you look down at your landscape or your, your property, your farm, wherever you live, your neighborhood, and get a feel for how spread out are the different beds um, on your landscape? Or are you creating these safe corridors 
for birds and butterflies and bees to move, to migrate around your property and between properties. So can you use, for example, a, a prairie planting like this to connect different landscape beds along a fence row? Okay, so, um, so combining these different landscape beds, connecting them to create these habitat corridors. Spend a little time talking about phenology, which is the sequence of bloom through the season. We're pretty early in the season here in Ohio. There's not much happening in my part of the state. Um, some red maple buds just starting to swell, but nobody's really blooming yet. But for those bees, um, we want to think about spanning the season with bloom. So do you have plants that bloom early in the season, like those maples, like those willows that are really good pollen and nectar sources early in the season? And then probably in your garden, you have lots that blooms in, in spring and lots that blooms in early summer. Um, but how about the heat of summer? And so that's a good time for the sunflowers and the cosmos and the zinnias um, that kind of fill in that space in the middle of summer when pollinators need. You know, they still need to eat, and you, you can add those, those plants in for the summer feeding. And then all the way through the late season. So again, back to the goldenrods, our asters, many of our native prairie plants that have that late season flowering to provide forage for um, bees before they overwinter. So, you know, our, our newly emerged que uh, queen bumblebees who have just mated, um, they need to feed on those nectar-rich plants late in the season so they go into winter in a, a well-fed, well-energized state. So kind of spanning the season of bloom in our gardens. So one way to talk about that is at least three species in bloom each season, spring, summer, and fall. Uh, for a lot of gardeners, that's no challenge, right? And this, uh, this garden on the left is a beautiful garden that's maintained in Door County, Wisconsin by master gardeners. And just, I mean, a wonderful, rich, complex plantings with lots that's blooming at all different seasons. If we look on the right, this is back to the wilds, that reclaimed strip mine. If you're doing a larger planting or maybe an all-native um, prairie kind of planting, it can be a little ch more challenging to incorporate those different species so that you have three in spring, three in summer, and three in fall. But that diversity over time is really going to bring in lots of different pollinators. So compare that to something like a, a planting of buckwheat that has an intensive period of bloom, doesn't last that long, but it's a great nectar source. But once it's done, it doesn't really offer that much. So we want to think about that continuous bloom through the season. We have a phenology calendar with Ohio State. If you Google Ohio State phenology calendar, um, you'll, you'll find that calendar. And what we have is a, um, it's a sequence. It shows a sequence of bloom throughout the season. These aren't all pollinator-specific plants, but many of them are. And so uh, looking across that top row, you can see we're not quite at silver maple blooming yet. And then next will be cornelian cherry dogwood, and then silver maple full bloom, and then red maple first bloom, speckled alder, first scythia, and so on. And this calendar actually goes um, quite a ways into the season, all the way through Rose of Sharon bloom, which is kind of our you know, late summer uh, bloomer. And so we can use this calendar to kind of pull in plants that will bloom in different sequences and at different periods. So even in an urban area, and actually, I shouldn't say even in, especially, sometimes, especially in urban areas, we can have a lot of diversity. Uh, one of our, co one of our um, webinar attendees made a comment about being in a community garden and wanting to know how to draw pollinators in, in that way. And community gardens can actually have a lot of diversity. They've got diversity in vegetables. Um, some of those vegetables will draw in pollinators, like squash and cucumbers. Um, blueberries and you know other desirable plants for the gardener, but also people put in herbs, which are wonderful, and annuals uh, to mix in. And then we have parks that have you know old trees, and we have little remnant forests that have a maybe more diverse plantings or, or uh, growth of, of native plants. And so we can have a great diversity of forage and the resulting diversity of, of uh, pollinators in urban areas. Some of the neatest studies have been done lately that really look at those urban areas and um, the diversity of, of pollinators. So we may not see certain bees quite as much in urban areas, but by mixing in more of those pollinator plants, we really can um, create that, 
um, that diversity, those layers, and that richness in, um, in those community gardens, in those neighborhoods. So putting our flowering habitat uh, close to crops, or I like to, to suggest putting the flowers right in the vegetable garden. So this is Cornell's um, plantation gardens in Ithaca, New York. And um, they have their sunflowers and their zinnias and their verbena and nasturtiums right in the vegetable garden. So not only are we drawing the pollinators into the garden, but we're also drawing in those natural enemies, the lacewings and the ladybugs that need often a nectar drink uh, before they lay eggs on um, your plants that have pests, your plants that have aphids. So put the flowers right in and through the garden versus having kind of a distinct patch out somewhere um, that's not connected to the garden space. Those small bees can't fly as far, so if they're nesting close by, they need that forage source close by. Just think of the wilds and those, those circles of habitat, the closer they are to that remnant forest where the pollinators are nesting, um, the more diversity they'll be in that little um, patch of, of plants, of flowers. So masses of color will attract the pollinators. So try grouping your plants together, even in a small garden, you can do this. You know, a bunch of purple cone flowers, a, a, a group of zinnias versus one here and one there. It also helps bees more, be more efficient in that behavior of flower constancy, right? Because they have that behavior where they want to visit species, uh, flowers of the same species in that same foraging trip. So if we help them out, we put the, the flowers all there together in a group, and they can forage and return to the nest and then come back to our gardens. Using more native plants, always a good idea. I mean, a lot of our gardens have many, many native plants. Um, and so adding more of those natives in that are um, key for pollinators helps to, to bring more of the native bees and other pollinators into the garden. And many of those plants are really, they deserve a great place in the garden. They're garden-worthy perennials, like, like hyssop, like um, this rattlesnake master. They, um, they add architecture, they add color, um, they add scent to the garden. Uh, one of our projects here in Ohio, we have uh, replicated plantings of 11 native perennials, and then we're um, observing those across the state and noting pollinator visitation. So there, other states are doing similar efforts, so there's been a lot of work to um, look at those native plants and which ones are really magnets for pollinators, which ones are also good, strong members of that, that garden community as far as being beautiful and being, you know, deserving a, a space in the garden. We all have limited space. Um, and, and bring lots of different uh, pollinators in. So let's talk about cultivars and hybrids, uh, which aren't necessarily bad. Many of them are very attractive to pollinators. This is a purple coneflower, of course, that, um, and this is what we call the straight species. So it comes back true to seed. It reseeds um, sometimes too much in the garden, uh, but it's not a, a cultivated variety. It's not a human uh, bred um, selection. Some of our selections, like this uh, hot papaya purple coneflower, uh, have, have had, they, they're not as favored by pollinators. So up at the Holden Arboretum Butterfly Garden, they have a number of these different cultivar purple coneflowers mixed in the butterfly garden, and their horticulturists have noticed that they're just not seeing the diversity of butterflies on those cultivars, on, um, you know, not having the bees visit quite as much. And so, you know, what makes that change is hard to say. Is it the color? Is it the quality or quantity of the pollen or nectar that's changed? Um, is it the complexity, you know, this really dense flower in the middle? And the pollinators can't quite figure out, or it's not very accessible, the reward in this flower. Um, so. For, for whatever reason, those cultivars may not be as desirable to pollinators. On the other hand, um, the, the bees and butterflies don't always um, know that, and they, um, they will readily visit those cultivars. So I think my, my point here is that you're best to um, you know, go ahead and plant those cultivars if you want them in the garden, but if you're trying to get the pollinators, be a good observer and notice, are, am I getting butterflies? on this purple coneflower, um, or the, you know, on the white variety, on the, on the green variety, or do I need to also include that straight species? So I'm giving the pollinators just what they want, and I also have those 
flower characteristics that add what I want into the garden. Uh, milkweeds are, are um, a great choice. As I said before, they're great for those monarch caterpillars. Um, they are also a really rich nectar source, and they're one of the best plants to bring in the beneficials, um, those, those natural enemies, the lacewings and the ladybugs and others that need that nectar drink. So um, be sure to include a lot of milkweeds. You know, we're trying to kind of recreate that lost milkweed habitat uh, across the country, and the gardens are a place that we can really concentrate and do that. If you have a shady garden, it's going to be a little harder, but it doesn't mean you can't garden for pollinators. Um, many hostas bloom beautifully in shade, and they're going to be inviting to lots of different bees. Uh, jewelweed, uh, Lindera, the um, spicebush, Itea, Fothergilla, just some examples of, of plants that can grow in shade, that flower well in shade, and that are also attractive to pollinators. So again, you may have to do a little more research to find those shade-tolerant plants, um, but they are out there. And so be, be a bee observer, looking at those plants. When you visit botanical gardens, when you visit garden centers, when you visit friends' gardens, you know, which plants are really the magnets? And um, can I incorporate more of those plants into my garden? I have a friend who was at a garden center shopping for salvias, and many were in bloom. She grabbed five or six, put them out in the sun, and waited to see which, which ones do the pollinators go to. And uh, that helped her decide which one she wanted. I'm not going to go into a lot of the different specific plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals. This is going to vary depending on your part of the country or your part of the world, as well as your site conditions. Is it sunny? Is it wet? Um, what, you know, what kind of, of location challenges do you deal with? But many of our native plants like red buds and service berry, dogwoods, cherries, excellent for not just for pollinators but also for other um, wildlife, for birds, for caterpillar habitat, so um, a, a real diverse um, addition to the, to the garden or to the landscape. For shrubs, again, lots of choices. The shrub dogwoods are excellent. Uh, Father Gilla, I mentioned, is a choice for a uh, shadier site. New Jersey tea, the clethras, viburnum, um, itea, and willows. Boy, pussy willow is a really nice, easy addition to the garden. And then perennials, annuals, herbs, all those. Uh, we have so many choices. When you look at plant lists, it, it's, really, um, it's really up to you. It's more a list of possibilities. And then the gardener goes through, chooses plants that fit your site or flowers that bloom, like you know, in colors that you're really um, attracted to. And you use that as a palette. So developing some of that nest habitat or protecting some of that ground nesting habitat is important if we're trying to encourage those, those um, solitary ground nesting bees. So those, um, those bare spots, these tend to be south facing sloping areas. In Ohio we have a lot of, of homeowners who call extension offices in the spring and they have these um, little volcanoes coming up in their lawn areas sloping south facing. And that's so that those, those bees can warm up in, um, in spring quickly. The, Soil is well drained, and that's why they, they pick that location. So can you tolerate them? Can you, can you live along with those bees? And um, they're only going to be active for a few weeks. Limiting tilling and use of mulch can help with those ground nesting bees. Our squash bees tend to nest in the pumpkin field if we let them, and they're ground nesting solitary bees. But if we till or if we use a plastic mulch, we're going to destroy the habitat for that squash bee. Bumblebee habitat, I talked about the bunch grasses, and um, they, they also nest in rodent holes uh, and cre crevices of rock walls underneath clay pots. Right? And you can buy or make a bumblebee uh, nest habitat, but they aren't said to, to really work much more than about a quarter of the time, about 25% of the time. So I like the clay pot upturned. You probably have some in your garage or your shed that you can put out uh, tomorrow and give that a try. That wood nesting habitat for the solitary bees, we're thinking about things like dead trees, like wood piles with some wood that you just let decay. Don't, um, you know, just have a section where you just let that wood there. At the um, Beetles will naturally move through that wood and make crevices 
and then our cavity nesting bees can move in to that wood. So that can be nice, rich additions, as well as, as uh, brush piles. Um, you know, everybody needs a brush pile, and those twigs then will naturally break down. So the cavity nesting bees will move in, they'll complete their life cycle, and then as that twig decays, they're going to move to another twig. How do we keep our pollinators healthy? So um, here's the, the kind of leaf disc that the leaf cutting bee removes from some of our plants. Not a health problem for plants, really just a cosmetic issue. If you mind how this looks, just pick off the leaves. Because your plant is fine with losing those, those discs. It's not really a health concern for, uh, for the plant. I've actually heard of horticulture professionals recommend an insecticide to put on those leaves to protect them for the leaf cutting bee. It's really unnecessary. It's, it's kind of an over, well, overkill, overuse of, of pesticide and um, really only a cosmetic issue. So pick off those leaves if they bother you or just show your friends that, um, you know, hey, I've got um, native bees nesting um, somewhere in my garden. A uh, source of water is important, and that can be a bird bath, a shallow dish that with a couple tw twigs in it so the butterflies and wasps and bees can land and then take a drink. It um, doesn't have to be a complicated water feature. You can put up tunnel nests to so these um, bee hotels. They're, they're starting to become in vogue for, garden, for gardens. Um, you see them at garden centers. Um, but they do require some care. It's sort of similar to bluebird boxes. You can't just put the bluebird box out and not tend it, not monitor it. And so you, we can have different pathogens, diseases move in to these, these tunnel nests. If we imagine, you know, compared to our brush pile where those twigs are breaking down and the bee is moving to another twig next year, uh, we're kind of concentrating the nesting in these little structures. And if we're not cleaning that, um, rotating out, sometimes putting paper twig liners in there um, so that Things like pollen mites and other um, pests and pathogens don't build up. Limit your pesticide use in the landscape. And you know in the garden, it, it's pretty easy to do this. We can all become a little more tolerant of some um, disease problems, of a little bit of insect damage, um, of some, some weed issues um, to reduce our overall pesticide use. In, in, the, in the garden for cosmetic use, um, I think we have some really good strategies to manage some of our pests. So this integrated approach where we're identifying the pest problem and then looking at all the different strategies that we may use, including pruning and picking um, horticultural varieties and cultivars that are resistant to different problems. So combining all these efforts with perhaps an insecticide, but something that's safe or safer for bees, something like a, a soap or an oil that doesn't leave a residue that's going to kill visitors that come um, after we've sprayed. Right? So using that integrated approach where we're really making a decision and not just grabbing a bottle of something and, and spraying. Inviting those beneficials, so all those things that we've talked about, the, the water source, the adding nectar-rich flowers, um, those are all going to help these beneficial insects, the natural enemies, come in. A tolerance for weeds. So I mentioned earlier that dandelions and white clover are two really good nectar sources for, uh, for different kinds of pollinators. And probably most of us can remember as, as kids a lot more dandelions and a lot more clover in lawns. And some of that is kind of coming back into vogue as people realize the, the, the habitat that that adds, the forage that that adds for, um, for bees, especially early in the season in that dandelion source. So a little bit more tolerance uh, for some of those weeds. And then tell people what you're doing. Having a sign like this one from the Xerces Society um, out there, if you're starting a butterfly garden or you're starting you know, in more of a public space, sometimes it takes a little while for those gardens to really come into their own. And so a sign can communicate, you know, we're doing, we're doing this on purpose. There's a reason we're trying to build pollinator habitat and uh, a nice way to advertise that. Here's what I consider a missed opportunity. This is a um, planting outside of a library in Akron, this huge swath of probably Goldsturm, Black-Eyed Susan uh, cultivar that hardly ever sees any pollinator visitors. 
So imagine if this has been instead kind of a diverse mix. You see the windows right there to the right. So the, the patrons are actually sitting in there reading, and we'd have these, um, you know, this show for them, these butterflies, birds, and hummingbirds, um, bees, all visiting those flowers um, that we could observe from, uh, from inside. So if you plant it, they will come. Um, I did want to share something that um, has really hit home for me lately, that calling the garden, especially if it's in a public place like this library, it's helpful to call it a butterfly garden versus a pollinator garden um, because people do get worried when they hear pollinators and they get nervous about bees. We actually had a project on one of our campuses that some of the faculty who are not in entomology or science, um, they were concerned that we were going to plant a pollinator garden and um, that their students were going to be stung. So we changed the name to uh, Monarch Garden and everybody seemed happy. And you know, when you've seen bees out there in the garden, they're busy, they're nectaring, they're, they're gathering pollen, um, they're not worried about uh, the people walking by. So a couple places to go to, uh, to learn more. Um, Xerces and Pollinator Partnership, both really excellent resources, good websites with lots of plant lists for you, um, lots of identification guides for pollinators, some really good materials, free online PDFs and uh, you know, printable or downloadable documents for you. So um, Xerces and Pollinator Partnership. And then I'm at the Ohio State Bee Lab and Pollinitarium, which is bee lab.osu.edu.